Good. Welcome, everyone, to our next lecture on machine learning. Today, we move on to a new topic. So we were talking about lots of things already recently about the support vector machines. And now we move on to yet another very important topic, which is kind of assumed that you know about it and that you know what it is. So it's about dimensionality reduction. OK, that's yet another very important concept in machine learning or in statistics general. And today we will look at it. And I will tell you today like linear solutions called principal component analysis. And there's lots of material online and in books on principal component analysis. The presentation here that you see in this lecture is kind of unique in with that respect that I'm using basically matrix notation for everything, everywhere where I can do it. And you might hate it at the beginning, right? Since it's not the usual way to present PCA that you know from books, but you should view it complementary to the stuff that you see elsewhere. So it's another way to write things down. And I want to convince you that it's a very powerful language to describe the stuff without any indexing almost. So I try to avoid indexing and use matrix differential calculus for the derivatives and all of this. And so it should be, maybe it's painful at first since it, you might be new to this kind of way of thinking, but once you can do it, it's very powerful because it directly translates into code. Right? So when you write code and have before this kind of notation with matrices on a piece of paper, you won't write for loops anymore. There's no for loop in your code afterwards. You will just use this matrix and vector way of thinking. And so I also try to write down the PCA derivation like in a matrix vector style. Yeah? And that should also help you write better code at the end. So, but let's first talk about dimensionality reduction. So what is that now? So dimensionality reduction, the high level idea is that we have some data where data just means we have some point cloud. So we just have inputs, we don't have any outputs. Yeah, you remember there was a distinction between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, you have inputs and outputs given as data and you're trying to learn a mapping. In unsupervised learning, you are only given the inputs you're also interested in a mapping somewhere yeah, into some other representation. However, there are no examples given. So the method must come up with the representation itself. So that is an example of unsupervised learning because the outputs are not given. So they should be also invented. Of course, there are many possibilities what you can do. right? So there is the possibility of clustering your data that would be, that would correspond to the classification problem right? that we've seen before. Um, today we will talk about this dimensionality reduction which more refers to the regression point of view. So you are trying to find a continuous output that represents your data. We will make this much more explicit. So uh, maybe to make it super explicit, I right away show you an image in, um, in my notebooks here. So basically suppose you have some data set, some 2D data set that has been rotated into 3D space, okay? So this is the data here, okay? Um, so you see it's actually two-dimensional. There are only two directions which are actually relevant, but the data is given with three coordinates. And those could be 1,000 coordinates, right? Or consider, for example, images of your lips while you're speaking. Yeah, then you might have 1,000 pixels or a megapixel image. However, there are only 10 muscles. So in principle, there should be a lower dimensional space that could describe the same data, right? I cannot make arbitrary movements with my lips. So there are only a few variables you can feed on. And dimensionality reduction means exactly that. Reduce these images to a lower dimensional representation. And today we will mainly look at a linear version of this called PCA. So what would be the output if this is my data that goes in? Then the output would be something like this. So now I remove the coloring. So now I have the same data, but now I have a new coordinate system found. OK, so now I have two new coordinate axes. And by kind of mapping this now onto these two new coordinates, I have a lower dimensional representation. And for example, in this case, I would get rid of the, the third component because there's no variance in here. OK, so that's something that I'm not interested in. Of course, now, you could also imagine having something which is in principle two-dimensional, so no advertisements here. So, but which is like in a nonlinear fashion kind of folded, yeah? or I could also roll it up or something. So that could be also your data set, that it looks like this, like a Swiss roll, and you try to recover basically the 
the two-dimensional representation of it. So that's an, an example of a nonlinear dimensionality reduction. Okay, but as always, we start with the linear case, right? That's the simplest one. Okay, so let's move on. What else do I have to say here? So what? Do we gain by this? A low dimensional representation might be useful then for subsequent tasks. Okay? So maybe on your data there's some noise, and you know there's lots of noise directions, and with the dimensionality reduction you're getting rid of the noise, and then you feed it into a classification method like support factor machine or something. So in a way you can also view it like a pre processing of your data. Okay? However, today with end to end learning, with deep learning, sometimes you just start with the raw data. But sometimes you can also play around with it and maybe you can reduce the dimensionality. So super simple approaches are just to ignore most of the dimensions, right? I could just randomly pick some. If I have 1,000 dimensional vectors, so why not just take randomly selected one? And that sounds like total garbage, but if your data is kind of in a general position, like it's not really aligned with any of the axes, then maybe the, the data is already represented by any tool that you choose here in this 3D space. And it, it's possibly even fine to do that. So to just ignore a couple of dimensions, OK? Um, a more informed way would be to do that, that you remove the dimensions of low variance. So you could calculate the variance in, for each of the dimensions, OK? And then you remove the one where there's not so much variance. So, for example, for the lip images, it would be like background stuff, right? Where my lips are not, but where there's just skin. And it is not really changing a lot while I'm speaking, right? Because it's like in the corner here or here. And so it's irrelevant. So I can just remove those pixels, yeah? Um, of course, now this gives us already a hint how to do it better, right? Um, I mean, you all know linear algebra, or at least after this lecture, you know linear algebra. So why not rotate the space or find a new coordinate system that maximizes the variance, OK? And that's it. That's PCA. That's what we will look at today. You are looking for directions in a high dimensional space that have the maximum variance. And then you get rid of all the others, OK? So PCA is doing exactly that, and by this being an instance of dimensionality reduction, however, of linear dimensionality reduction. So we are looking for linear combinations of all dimensions. So finding a new coordinate system, like here in, in 3D, finding a 2D coordinate system then corresponds to having a data point and then projecting it onto this plane. And that is exactly that this vector here basically is three numbers, and this vector is three numbers. And then projection just means that I take linear combinations of the coordinates of this point that I want to project on. And the weights for these linear, co uh, this linear combinations are exactly the coefficients of these vectors. Okay, that's just how linear algebra works. So everything here we talk about is based on linear algebra right now. Okay, in particular, we need the singular value decomposition and the eigenvalue decomposition. And I guess they were invented exactly for this task. Okay, so let's try to write it down more formally. So what is dimensionality reduction in general, linear and nonlinear case? So we are given some data points, yeah? And in this case now, it's the data set where I'm having column vectors, okay? And I have the different data points along the column. So each column is a column vector. Now the goal is to find a low dimensional representation Z where I'm now having a little d here. And so the little d should be a number that is typically much smaller than the capital D. So I reduce the dimensionality. However, I want to find a representation that keeps most of the properties of the higher dimensional data. OK? So properties. What, are, what properties am I talking about? So for PCA, it will be variance, of course. OK? So variance will be the one, the spread. Yeah? That is the one that I want to keep by PCA. However, there are others, right? Suppose you have this Swiss roll example. Maybe you want to keep neighborhood relationships. So if you're at a certain location and then other points are in your neighborhood, yeah, then you want to stay in the neighborhood of those points. In particular, it means if you are like on this nonlinear manifold looking like this or this kind of surface, then if I unfold it like that, I'm still in the same neighborhood. So my neighborhood around is still the same. However, if, if my Swiss roll is kind of touching like this, 
then it can be very difficult, of course. So there must be a separating space in here to have the right notion of neighborhood. And those will be methods we will look at next time, OK? Good, other properties we want to keep. Classification label could be another one, right? I mean, why not? I mean, you have digits, high dimensional digits, which are like 28 by 28 pictures, and you want to reduce the dimensionality in such a way that the class label kind of is, uh, if you have two points with the same class label, they should stay close to each other, OK? That would be another possibility. And that's actually what the neural network is doing, right? When you do a lot of convolutional layers, we'll explain what this is later. And then at the end, you have a representation from which you kind of can read off the classes. Then that's the nonlinear dimensionality reduction that did exactly that. It reduced the dimensionality to a lower dimensional space in such a way that certain properties were kept. In this case, class relationship. Okay, so it can be all framed into this concept. Now, what is a representation? Um, of course, one possibility is um, somehow I, I need to find a mapping F that kind of maps a point from R to the D, capital D, into R to the D with a little d. Yeah? So then I can represent uh, my data by writing down a mapping. Okay. Um, so, for example, if I have a linear mapping, yeah, if I have some matrix W that I multiply here from the left, right, since in this case X, the first dimension is the number of input dimensions, then I'm projecting it onto the columns of W. So the columns of W are exactly these axes, and I'm projecting it on them, okay? Then my mapping would be represented by my matrix W, okay? So the goal would be to find a matrix W, and that would be the goal of PCA, for example. Um, typically, the W is a rectangular matrix, right? Because I want to reduce the dimensions. So in principle, I might have only, let's say I want to reduce the dimensions to two, then my W would be having two columns, OK? And the dimensionality of each column is this capital D. So actually, I have two vectors in this higher dimensional space. So I would have two three-dimensional vectors. That would be my matrix W, exactly that. In order for this projection to work nicely, of course, the norms of these column vectors should be one, right? Then the projection is as simply as this. If not, you would have to also normalize the whole thing. And you typically you multiply from the left with the inverse of W transpose W. Yeah, that's the um, Gram-Schmidt. No, what is it called? There's a word for this. Hilbert Schmidt, so there's some norm also normalization method for this, okay? So basically you can normalize the whole stuff, okay? Whatever it's called. Um, in principle, um, the W can be an arbitrary rectangular matrix, right? Um, oh, yeah, so the first point was that I have uh, only a few non-zeros along the diagonal. So that is the, I basically, right now I explained the second point. But there's a simpler version of the W where basically the W is a diagonal matrix. So what do I mean by a um, rectangular matrix which is diagonal? So by this I mean the W is a matrix which could look like that. And as I said, every column here is kind of a vector in this high dimensional space. However, I could also have a very simplified version where I'm just having ones and a big zero over here. Okay? So that would be a matrix which is projecting out all the um, lower components. Of course, you could also have one where you, where you whatever, have a one, one here, and then you get a zero, and then you have a one over there. But this here would get rid of this one, the, the third dimension, and so on and so forth. So the first point here is that the W also includes the case of ignoring dimensions. However, my description was a bit different. OK, um, so basically now the W, as you know, is a matrix, and matrices, they parameterize linear maps. OK, that's just how it is. Now, what about if I have a nonlinear one? So a nonlinear one, the answer could be right away taking your network, right? So let's parameterize it with a neural network. And that is a possible answer. Yeah, so that F could be parameterized by some weights in some neural network. We haven't talked about it, but I think most of you know already some, something about it. Okay, so we've seen it already. So basically, then the weights of the neural network parameterize the map. Okay, so that is the first possibility how we could have representations. We can, rep we can parameterize 
the map basically by some function f which has parameters. Okay, and then we would say the parameters of the map are parameterizing our representation. However, there are also methods that do it non-parametrically. So non-parametrically just means there are no parameters. Okay, and examples are these isomap and LLE methods that we will look at next time. Okay, so now how do they uh, represent it? How can they do it without parameters? Basically by only looking at a particular data set and then saying um, I'm representing these ones. Oh, here's some typo. There's an element missing on there as well. So I'm representing basically this data set by a set of lower dimensional vectors. So this is basically representing the mapping by giving examples, okay, by giving it a data set. And here the thing I need to optimize would be the z1 to zn. So in a way, z1 to zn are the parameters of this map. Typically, these kind of methods are called non-parametrically because um, the number of parameters will increase with the number of data points that you have. In these examples, my matrix W is a D by D matrix, so this size of the matrix is fixed. So the number of parameters is fixed. That's why it's called a parametric method. For the neural network, it's the same thing. My network architecture fixes the number of parameters. It's a parametric method. However, in statistics, there are also non-parametric methods, and they are basically also having numbers to optimize, but the numbers, so the amount of numbers that you need to optimize will increase with the amount of data that you will collect. Okay, so in that case, it's a non-parametric method. Okay, here's a question for you. So what about a support vector machine? Is it a parametric method or is it a non-parametric method? What would you think? Any ideas? Any suggestion? Non-parametric is the right answer. Why do you think it's non-parametric? Yeah, that's, that's the answer. It depends on the data. Of course, all methods depend on the data, but the parameter vector is the alpha, right? And the alpha, the length of alpha is the number of data points. And so if you have more data points, your alpha will get longer. And so for that reason, there's not a fixed parameter vector that we are learning here in the um, support vector machine, but we are having um, a representation where the describing vector grows with the number of data points. However, of course, it would have been also true to say it's a parametric method, right? Because so if you look at the linear support vector machine, you are basically optimizing for the vector w, which has length d, the dimensionality of the data. So if you run the linear support vector machine as the primal problem, you have a parametric method, and if you run the dual problem, you have a non-parametric method, okay? So I hope you get the gist of this. So these terms parametric and non-parametric will appear more often in the, in the lecture. So it's, it's some, something that sometimes confuses you. I have a nice book that is called All of Statistics from Larry Wasserman, very nice, and it's a great book. And surprisingly, there's a second book which is called All of Non-Parametric Statistics. And when I, after I bought that, I, when it appeared, I thought, man, I thought I have already everything of statistics, so why do I need another one, right? So, but, so there are these different branches of statistics, so the parametric methods and the non-parametric methods, okay? Anyway, so now what do we do with other points, right? If we represent our map non-parametrically, what can we do with other points, okay? So how do we do it? Basically, there are now some recipes. So we could, for example, take a new point and look for the nearest neighbor in my data set, maybe even finding the convex combination of data points, getting the weights to get a convex combination of that. And then we would say the mapping is just a convex combination of the image of those data points, okay? And by that, we could also generalize to other points. But it's a hack a little bit, right? However, that's exactly how a support vector machine is doing it, right? When you remember the decision function, it's calculating the kernel function for a new data point with xi comma x, right? So xi is one of the training examples. So basically, you are, you are measuring the similarity of a new data point to the training set and then are generating a sample or a decision from that one. So it's the same idea in a way. So the nearest neighbor is just another way for having a kernel function, okay? But there are also other possibilities. 
Okay, so this is very general representations. Let's become very concrete now. Let's talk about the linear case where we model everything with the matrix W. So this will be principal component analysis. So the short version, as I said, is find a new coordinate system that matches the data, where matching means keep properties, where properties means keep the variance. Okay, that is PCA, that is the overall idea. So if you have a data set, which for me is some cloud of points here in 3D, for example, then you could by hand immediately do PCA by drawing an axis for the longest variance, okay, and draw another orthogonal axis for the second largest variance and the third one for the third largest variance. So that is basically P PCA visually, okay? And now how to get these vectors automatically? That we will see in words already, so you hear it already, calculate the covariance matrix, right? That is describing the ellipticity kind of of your data set. And then you do an eigenvector decomposition, okay? However, there are other ways to do this. By the way, the idea is very old. Um, I think these references I copied from Wikipedia. So from 1901, from Carl Pearson, one of the great statisticians, he wrote a paper in Philosophical Magazine, okay? That's where science also appears. Um, and basically the title is already a description of exactly what PCA is doing. The paper is on lines and planes of closest fit to systems of points in space. So we have the points in space, and for example, we're trying to find this one line that is the closest fit to the data, which is like the primal direction of PCA. Or maybe a plane of closest fit, so that would try to fit like a two-dimensional coordinate system into the higher dimensional spaces, okay? And it was also popularized by other authors like Harold Hoteling, so where analysis of complex, of a complex of statistical variables into principal components. That's not such a descriptive title to my ears, but in principle, he's talking about the same thing. Here, more names for PCA. Again, I copied them from, I think from this webpage, and I copied them a couple of years ago. Maybe there are further names now. Those are, in principle, all the same stuff. However, sometimes the data is along the columns, sometimes the data is along the rows, sometimes you first remove the mean, sometimes you don't, sometimes you are a sociologist, sometimes you are working in biology. So every field that has data often came up with these kind of ideas independently of everybody else. But in principle, they are the same. Maybe from, um, I'm not sure, so Cahun and Löwe transform is something in signal processing, for example. I think the German one is missing. So in um, linear algebra, this whole thing is called Hauptachsen transformation. And when you think about it, Hauptachse, that's exactly principal component, okay? And so it's a principal component transformation. That's Hauptachsen transformation. And now let's replace transformation with the process of finding these principal components, and you have an analysis, and you have PCA, okay? So it's all the same. Okay, here comes PCA version one. So suppose now we, we are trying to find like a lower dimensional space, and that should minimize the mean squared error. Okay, that is the idea of fitting like a low dimensional coordinate system to your data, okay? So let's assume for simplicity that the mean is already gone. Then the notation simplifies. Now comes the first matrices here. So the goal is to find a lower dimensional embedding, yeah, which is this data matrix Z, that will approximate my x, okay? And of course, I also need a linear mapping w that kind of maps my low dimensional data back into the high dimensional space, okay? And then I can write this down as a mean squared error. So basically, I want to minimize the distance between a data point and its representation mapped back into the space. As I said, the w is a matrix uh, let's say for specificity now, this um, high dimensional space is 10 dimensional and the lower dimensional space is two dimensional, okay? So what we have here is the zi, it's a two dimensional vector. So I have two numbers and now w times zi, yeah, I, maybe I do it on the board because that's like super essential to understand that. So suppose your w, where's my eraser? Ah, here. Um, so the, the W is now a 10 by 2 matrix. Basically consisting of two long vectors, okay, of length 10. 
and I have two of them. And now if I'm mapping a single data point xi, so what is it doing? It's always the same operation. It's always matrix, matrix multiplication. So I'm really, um, I'm having a matrix with these two column vectors. So what I'm really doing here is just the first component of it, now the notation doesn't get nicer, times w1 plus w2 times the second component, so the second coordinate of it. So it's really that simple. So you could also shuffle it around. It's a, it's a weighted average of w1 and w2. Or you could also view it, w1 is a 10-dimensional vector, and w2 is a, another 10-dimensional vector. Yeah? And so in this space, basically you're now taking a linear combination and then picking out a vector on the plane okay, that is spent by these two, um, these two vectors. So the W spends a two-dimensional subspace in 10 dimensions, and basically the xi is kind of picking kind of a linear combination in this space. Okay, so that's what it's doing. It's projecting it back. And um, of course, we want to optimize not only over W. In this case, we also have to optimize over the Z. And the best one for a given projection will be just like the, oh, the, the best solution for the Z will be exactly the projection of X onto these two vectors. Okay, that's just what it is. However, let's look at the way to write it down. Of course, we, we want to have this for all data points, so we sum it all up. So we have the mean squared error. And now this expression can be rewritten also nicely using the Frobenius norm. Okay? And once you're happy with that step, it's very powerful because then kind of we can use matrices for the whole thing. So let's try to understand this step here. Okay? So let me try to write it down. Um, first of all, oh, you can't see it, so now you can see it. So what I just said is we not only want to minimize this uh, squared error for a single data point, but for all of them and we average over all these errors. Okay, so it's a mean squared error. And now the question is why can we rewrite this expression also in a matrix fashion? So how can we do this? Okay, and let me demonstrate it on the board because that's something which I find very essential to get. Okay, so um, let me see. So let's say we have the first one, which is, um, oh, let's write it, write it up like that. So first of all, those are vectors, right? So this is a 10-dimensional vector, and this is now a 10-dimensional vector. And if I take the norm squared, it's basically the same as saying I'm calculating the inner product with itself, OK? So far, so good. Now, the inner product is basically summing up all entries, right, of these vectors. So in principle, it's the same as, oh, this is n, 1 over n, i being equal to 1 to n, summation over j being equal to 1 to, in this case, it would be 10. Yeah? In general, it would be this capital D, okay, summing up all the entries of this form here, so which is xi minus wzi. And I will take the j's entry of this vector. And I'm summing them all up squared. Now, if I look at this expression here, yeah, in a way, I can also put them all in a gigantic matrix. And so I could say x1 minus wz1. So that is one vector. And then up to xn minus w. That n. So I can plug in all these entries into a big matrix. And now this is a capital D by n matrix. OK? Another way to write this matrix is just to say that is capital X minus W times Z. OK? So why is that the case? I mean, the X contains just the X1, X2, up to Xn. OK, so that is a matrix that contains all of those. The W times Z matrix contains the WZ1 as the first column, WZ2 as the second column, up to WZN as the last column. OK, and so now by taking the difference between these matrices, I'm doing exactly this operation that I wrote on the left-hand side. 
Now, when I look at that one here, basically what I'm doing is I'm summing up all entries squared. Okay? I'm taking for every i and for every j, I'm taking kind of the, this is choosing the column, and this thing is choosing then the row, okay? A particular coordinate of the i's column vector, okay? And so I'm basically summing up over all entries of this matrix. And now remember, we had this interesting way to do that. So one possibility would be taking this Radamar product, which is basically in Python would be A star A, so component-wise multiplication, and then summing everything up. Okay, so that is summing up all squared entries. So um, writing it like in a matrix fashion would be A transpose A, and then taking the trace of that one. Okay, and that is exactly the Frobenius norm. Um, let's see, of A squared. So now what was this guy? So that is what I mean by Fro, okay? So that has nothing to do with uh, Lord of the Rings or something. So this is the Frobenius norm. And I have a, have a slide on this one. So what is it? So usually for scalars, kind of if you want to get rid of the sign, we square it, and then we know something about the magnitude of it, like the size of a number, right? A minus 10 is, has the same size as a plus 10, okay? And basically size is something like, yeah, distance from the origin. Uh, we can also have something like that for vectors, which is just the inner product with itself, so it's just summing up the squared entries. And so why not have something like that also for matrices? And as it turns out, when you work out the math for this one, you will get exactly these entries all squared. Okay, so that would be something, if you're not sure that this is true, I think I calculated it already in one of the previous lectures. So please check that you understand to go from here to here. I mean, the short story is, so basically the matrix matrix multiplication here is giving you a row times column, but since we are transposing the matrix A, it's giving you a column times column, okay, and then summing everything up. That is the J. The trace is summing up then all diagonal entries of the resulting matrix, and that is the I, okay? So to write it like this is on a sheet of paper, super useful for algebra and for derivatives and everything. However, you would never compute it like that, right? Because this is um, first doing a matrix matrix multiplication, which is O of n to the cube, okay? And then summing up the diagonal. So you're ignoring most of the stuff that you computed. Okay, so this is the computational way how to calculate it. It will be just A star A and then sum everything up. But mathematically, it's nice to write it like this as a trace, okay? And maybe sometimes then you use this Frobenius norm. I'm always confused. There is an L2 norm for matrices too, right? There is one. However, that one is calculating the largest eigenvalue of A transpose A for whatever reason that was chosen like that. I find it confusing. However, I find this Frobenius norm much more natural in our setup here, and often we drop this Fro sub-index. And if there are matrices here and I'm writing the norm, it's always the Frobenius norm. I never ever take the other one, okay? Good, uh, you might ask, so how are they related? In principle, since you're only looking at the largest eigenvalue, you know you can arbitrarily choose the other eigenvalues without changing this norm, okay? And the Frobenius norm is taking into account everything, while the this typically largest eigenvalue norm here is only looking for the largest eigenvalue. So it's kind of bounding like the overall impact. Or another way to view it, if you imagine um, matrices to be like long cigars, like ellips ellipsoid things, the, this norm here, the bottom one, is only looking for the largest extension of your cigar, right? And the Frobenius norm is kind of looking at everything. Okay, good, so that's the Frobenius norm, great. So basically that is the trace of this matrix here multiplied with itself. And I hope I convince you on the board that the summation over all data points and then having the inner product of these vectors can be written like squaring up all elements of this matrix over here. Okay, good, so far so good. Um, next, 
Let's define the covariance matrix. And in a nice way to write it down, we can just write it to be 1 over n times x times x transpose. That is another fancy way of writing stuff up. So let's see on the board how this is the usual covariance matrix. So the usual covariance matrix is one where we um, basically measure the squared distance to the mean. OK, so the one that you might know looks like this. You are saying xi minus mu squared into averaging over that one. OK, so that is typically how you, how you would calculate a variance. OK, now if I do it in a vector fashion, if they are all vectors in a multivariate setup, then in, I would do it like this. I would take the outer product of these two vectors and then summing everything up. Okay. However, here we are in a simplified situation. We say the mean is 0. Okay. And in that case, now we can write it i equals 1 xi x1 transpose. And um, curiously, um, this summation now can be also put into a matrix matrix multiplication. Yeah? And it turns out that this thing is calculating the right thing here. Maybe, okay, maybe it's still a bit confusing. So um, how exactly does it work? Okay, let's look at this matrix. So basically now the matrix matrix multiplication here that I'm doing are taking all the, the full first row of x and taking the inner product with the first column of x transpose, so with the row itself. Okay? So the top left corner here, it will be basically 1 over n and then the summation, i being equal to 1, of all data points xi, yeah? but taking the first entry of it and square it. Okay? So by going over the columns of x, I'm going over all data points. So that is this index here. By being in the first row of x, I'm looking at the first coordinate over here. Okay? And I'm multiplying it with the first coordinate, so with itself. That's why it's just squared. And this is a scalar now. And similarly, I can fill up this matrix. So I will have, um, again, i equals 1 to n. And then I have xi. But now I'm having the last row, so this will be the d squared. OK. Uh, is it right? No, it's not right. So this is now slightly wrong. So this will be xi. And I'm taking the um, first index and multiply it with the last one. So now what's happening here? What I just wrote down is the expression for the first row multiplied with the last column of that one. And the last column of x transpose is the last row of my matrix x. That's why I'm having here a d. Okay? And you see what I'm doing here. I mean, this is an estimate of the variance for the first coordinate. Okay? This is an estimate of the covariance of the first with the last one. Okay? And so on and so forth. And you can fill it, fill it all up. Then if you drag out the summation, you basically have this expression up here. OK? However, the short story is this is the covariance matrix. And once you figure that one out for you, once and for all, you can always write it down like this, which is then super easy and super powerful. Often I forget the 1 over n. I just omit it, because it's just a constant. OK? So that is the relevant stuff. Now you might ask, so what about this one? I mean, they are, how are they related? And they are related, and we will see today that they will have basically the same eigenvalues, which is super useful. Okay? Um, sometimes you calculate that one. Sometimes you calculate that one. So this is containing the inner products of all the data vectors. And this thing is containing all the outer products summed up of all the vectors. Okay? Good. Again, so those, this is the complicated notation that you need to grasp, so that basically um, the covariance matrix can be written like that. So now, the version 1 
is minimizing the mean squared error. We are looking for, uh, for embeddings and a mapping, okay, that kind of minimizes the error, where we kind of pre choose the d, little d, to be equal to 2. So we're trying to find a two dimensional subspace and embeddings. Um, then the answer today that we will find out will be that the optimal w is exactly the matrix that contains the d columns yeah, from this eigenvector decomposition. I again will explain what this is, yeah, but those are basically like the hauptachsen of the matrix, of the covariance matrix, okay? And you pick those d columns that correspond to the d largest eigenvalues. And you get it already, the eigenvalues, they correspond to the variance, which kind of makes sense. Again, think of the cigar and about like the, the hauptachsen of the cigar, like the longest direction that basically the eigenvalue will tell you how long the cigar is, okay, the, the largest eigenvalue. And that is exactly the variance. Good. Another way to talk about it is that this WZ, yeah, that that is a low rank approximation of X. Okay, so the X is my data matrix, and now I am having a low rank approximation. So what do I mean by Z1? So in principle, you know, the, the rank of a matrix um, cannot be larger than the number of rows or the number of columns, okay? So basically, the minimum of both. So um, the rank of X is less than or equal the minimum of N and D, okay? So if I have lots of data points, 1,000 data points in a five-dimensional space, I can only spend a five-dimensional space. So my basis would only need five vectors, okay? That's it, I don't need more. Um, so that's like a general thing. So now low dimensional representation, low rank dimensional, uh, low rank representation of X means find a matrix which looks almost like that one, but which has an even lower rank, okay? So let's, here's another one. So what about this one? What's the rank of that one? Can we also, say less than or equal to something? Any suggestion what we could put in here? I mean, the obvious thing is, okay, it's again, it's a matrix with n columns and with d rows, so I can put n and d in here, right? But that's not very low. Can we write something else in here? Any suggestion? Then I, then I show you the matrix W, I'll show you again. So, for example, the matrix W contains of two column vectors, okay? And then the whole thing gets d-dimensional, and here I have a little d, okay? And then I have my z, which is basically a d by n matrix, okay? And the curious fact is a matrix, which is a product of these matrices here, yeah, cannot have a rank larger than d. So this is n comma little d, okay? For me, this is always, I always think of Schoko bars when I see this, okay? You know, this company where there are two in there, right? This is exactly the picture. And if you have this Schoko bar combination of two matrices, the overall rank of the resulting matrix cannot be larger than the smallest rank in between. Another way to view it is if you map data with this one, yeah, with this overall matrix, Maybe you start with an n-dimensional vector, but then you map it into two dimensions, and then you blow it up again to d. So you go from a high-dimensional space in between to something very low-dimensional, and then you blow it up again. But when you are in this low-dimensional space, it means the result at the end will be also like a low-dimensional subspace of the result. So that's why this thing is called a low-dimensional, uh, a low-rank approximation of x. I mean approximation because we are minimizing the Frobenius norm of this one. So we are trying to find another matrix with two components, which are low, which is, is a low rank representation of a given data matrix, okay? So that's uh, what the words are for that I showed you here. So I talked about Frobenius norm already. Here's another va variant. So the minimizing mean squared error is one possibility. The other one is maximizing the variance. That is another point of view for the PCA. And let's try to formulate that one as well. So let's try to find the one direction yeah, that has the largest variance, okay? And this can be written as an optimization problem. Maximize, basically, the variance of W transpose times all data points. So we are looking for the direction W, 
if I project everything onto it, yeah, my variance should be maximized. And so if I have, again, this long cigar thing, and I'm projecting, uh, so my cigar is like this, and my, my vector is not the right direction, my variance is kind of too small. But if I point into the right direction, my variance is maximized. OK? And that is the way to write it down. Again, here I'm assuming that the w has length 1. OK? So otherwise, my variance could grow indefinitely, right? I could just increase the w. But if I say my w should have length 1, then find me the direction that is maximizing the variance. Again, this can be also rewritten now in a matrix vector multiplication. So this is a row vector, and it's multiplied by my data matrix. So basically, the result of w transpose x will be a very long row vector, where I have a single entry for all my data points. Okay, And then I can ask, so what is the variance of those? Hereby note, if x has mean 0, yeah, then also every linear projection will have mean 0. Yeah, that's why this formula is really an estimator for the variance. OK? So um, again, let's calculate the covariance matrix. And then one can show that the lambda, yeah, and the, uh, so let's suppose lambda and w are the largest eigenvalue and the corresponding eigenvector of this matrix. Then one can, can show that these, um, this w is exactly the one that's maximizing here the variance. That's something that we will show in the following slides. In general, we could also try to write it down to find simultaneously several directions that we would write down, um, basically maximize, again, the Frobenius norm of this one. So this is mapping my data now onto like a low-dimensional embedding, right? Remember that the W was this matrix with these two Shoko bars. If you transpose it, you are projecting the 10-dimensional vectors onto two dimensions, OK? And then by Frobenius norm, you are just summing up two variances, the variance of one direction plus the variance of the other direction. Then we have this constraint over here that is basically saying W should be like an orthonormal system. So basically, the columns of W are all vectors of length 1, and they are all orthogonal to each other. And that can be written in matrix fashion by W transpose W being equal to identity matrix. right? Length 1 are the entries on the diagonal being orthogonal to each other are the off-diagonal entries, OK? By the way, we are having this Shoko bar no, um, notation. W times W transpose doesn't have to be the identity matrix. So if W is this matrix and they are both orthogonal to each other, that means that if I have W transpose W, that will be this 2 by 2 matrix, OK? And since this is expressing that the length of each column vector is 1, and it's expressing that they are orthogonal to each other, OK? However, the other way around, this will be a large 10 by 10 matrix, OK? And this is not the identity matrix. Even worse, the rank of this matrix is at most two, right? Because again, I'm having a product between two matrices which are both low rank. And if you multiply two vectors, uh, two matrices with each other, you cannot just invent rank from it. I think maybe there's, maybe there's a formula like that. So maybe I should look it up that the rank of A times B is probably less than or equal the rank of A as a minimum it must, be, it must be a formula like this, minimum of rank of A and rank of B. So I'm sure there must be a formula like that. Yeah? At least it makes sense. And there are some thumbs up. OK, good. So these are like two by something matrices. So the rank of this gigantic thing can be only maximally two. So it cannot be the identity matrix, because the identity matrix has full rank. OK? Good. This is probably much more linear algebra than you really enjoy. However, by going through this and extending your knowledge about vectors, you will become a better programmer, because you can directly write the code like this, right? You use matrices and vectors. You won't use any for loops anymore if you can do this, OK? And that's super useful to do, OK? Good. In the following, then, we will show that this matrix W kind of will be the minimum of um, also the least square problem, and it's the same as maximizing the variance. 
So we will briefly show that whether you maximize the variance or whether you minimize the, minim the mean squared error is the same thing, will give you the same result. Okay? There are just two points of views for the PCA. For that reason, in um, some presentations of PCA, they start to say, okay, we are now having a great method and it's maximizing the variance. And here's the algorithm, and it turns out they are just the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Another book you open and they say, okay, what we are showing you a nice method called PCA, and we are minimizing the mean squared error of some embedding. And as it turns out, going through the mass at the end, those are just the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. So you end up with the same solution, but having two different starting points, okay? And I show you both. However, we are already ready for the algorithm slide, okay? So that's something you need to implement on your new exercise sheet. It looks very long, but it's just because I wrote it down very detailed and you can just copy it line by line, okay? So your data matrix X, suppose it's having all data vectors as columns, and let's assume the mean is already gone, okay? That just simplifies everything. First of all, calculate a covariance matrix, which you really can just write X at X dot T. So you can really take the outer product and you get the covariance matrix. That's it, okay? Um, in principle, when you implement it, you would use the function cov. There's a function cov in NumPy that you can use. However, there are also some fallacies. The question is, are you calling cov on x or are you calling cov on x transpose, right? So you either get one or the other and you need to check by hand which is right. But I think there's a question on the exercise sheet where you should implement the covariance matrix yourself, okay? And just use this formula. Then you calculate the eigenvector decomposition. And also for this, there's a magic function, typically called eig, E-I-G. It's also a library function. And that one that you can use. There's another one, eig h, I think, which sorts the eigenvalues already for you. And on the exercises, it will tell you which one you should use. And this gives you two matrices, lambda, this is the one in the middle, and v, okay? And what you should do when you calculate the eigenvector decomposition of sigma, check that this is the same thing. So really take the w and the lambda, uh, the v and the lambda, and multiply them with each other and check that you really get the same matrix. Do it by hand and check it. I always do, right? So that's super important. So we can re rewrite our v with column vectors, okay, and give them names. And we can also give names for all the entries of our diagonal matrix lambda, okay? They are called little lambda, little one, lambda 1 to lambda d. And here I'm assuming that lambda 1 is the largest one and lambda d is the smallest one, okay? Now for our embedding, we pick the little d largest eigenvalues. They carry most of the variance, okay? And then we pick the according eigenvectors to those. And that will be our solution. That is our, basically our principal, those are our principal components. Here's the word eigenvector spectrum, and eigenvector spectrum is just if you plot all your eigenvalues, like in a little line diagram. You see off, you will have a function that falls down very quickly. And typically, you will see like some edge at some point. Maybe you say, okay, this is enough, and the rest are noise, and the other ones I keep. Okay, so that is the eigenvector spectrum. Um, okay, now, how do you project on this data? So luckily, these, these V vectors are already normalized for you, okay? So why can we do that? Because like the length of the vectors, they are basically put into this diagonal matrix. So the diagonal matrix will scale the cigar long enough, right, to, to have the right coordinate system. The vectors that you get in this matrix V, they all have the same length being equal to one, okay? So that's a unitary matrix. So projecting on it is just taking the transpose of the selection of D vectors and mapping the data from the right on, onto it. However, I think in the exercise sheet, you are asked to implement the whole thing for an N by D matrix. And this is not to confuse you, but this is just how typically in machine learning, the data points are along the rows, okay? The reason being that suppose you have MNIST, and you want to select the fifth data point, you want to just say X bracket open five bracket close, and you will get the fifth row. That's very useful to do. Otherwise, you always have a colon, comma, colon, comma, X, or comma, something. So, but for the mass and for visually seeing that this is a covariance matrix and all of these things, 
I prefer the notation on sheets of paper where they are all columns. However, it messed up my code, this same thing. So I also did it wrong. Part of my code was written like that, the other one the other way around, and everything was a big mess. So it's annoying, and I have no easy solution for this. Okay? Good, just make sure that you know what you're doing. In particular, if you transpose it, you need to multiply the matrix V from the right-hand side in your implementation. Okay? So when you implement it for the transpose matrix here, yeah, you need to multiply it from the other side. That's just how it is. It's annoying, but those are the like, little tricks that you need to figure out yourself in the code. Okay? The good thing is NumPy will yell at you if you do it the wrong way around because the matrix sizes, they don't match each other. Okay? Good, that is already the embedding. However, possibly we also want to rescale the axis. Yeah? So possibly we want to have that the resulting embedding has a new covariance matrix being the identity matrix. So basically maybe before I have a cigar and after my embedding I have a sphere, like something where every direction is the same. Or I think how the physicists are saying the data should be isotropic. So no matter in what direction you are going, you will always have the same variance. And for the cigar, that's not the case. I mean, that's the whole point of PCA, to find out the directions of variance. But possibly your pre-processing wants to get rid of this variance. And this process is called whitening. And to do it, you multiply it with the square root of this lambda thing. And um, let's calculate the covariance matrix of this guy. OK, let's do that. OK, so let me do it on the board um, and see whether it's really something interesting or whether it really gets the identity. So <coughs> I think the projection is something like this. This is minus a half square root. So what is it, by the way? So if the lambda, is this on the video? No, it's not. OK, no. OK, maybe let's write it down here. So if this is your lambda matrix, OK, suppose only the, now we can take all of them, whatever. OK, I, I can take all of them. So this is lambda 1 to lambda d. OK, then lambda to the minus a half is the matrix where I'm having 1 divided by the square root of lambda 1. So for most operations that look complicated on matrices, if you have a diagonal matrix, you just apply this operation on the diagonal. OK? That holds, for example, for the matrix exponential or for the matrix square root or for the matrix whatever you name it. OK? For a diagonal matrix, it's always easy how to do the operation. If you don't have a diagonal matrix, you first do an SVD and apply the operation on the diagonal, and that's it. But that's a different story. Good. Now I wanted to show you, let's see, I have the V transpose, and then I have the X. And now I was claiming that basically um, the covariance matrix of my Z now will be the identity matrix. OK, let's write it down and ideally profit now from nice notation. I omit the 1 over n. OK, this is the covariance matrix now. This is super easy to write down once you are happy with this notation and you made sure you understand why this is the covariance matrix. Let's plug everything in. So um, basically, it's lambda a half v, whoops, x x transpose, v transpose times lambda a half. OK, so far so good. Then the x x transpose, we had an eigenvector decomposition for that one, right? So we were rewriting it. Oh, here's the transpose missing, and there's one too many. So we had an eigenvector decomposition. So we plugged this thing into the eigensolver and got this v, lambda v, transpose, such that those are the same. So I can plug it in here, right? So let's put the other stuff back. Oh, no, not on the video. So how much is on the video? Oh, it's also small anyway. Ah, OK. So let me turn the camera a bit. And let's turn it back. OK, now it should be on the video. Lucky, hopefully, the contrast is good enough. So um, this thing is the identity matrix because the V is a unitary matrix. 
this thing is the identity matrix, and the lambda minus a half times lambda times minus a half is the identity matrix. So that's the proof. Of course, I omitted the 1 over n here. I could have dragged in then the 1 over n to z1. Fine, but it doesn't make a big difference here. Okay? So there you see, to, to show something like this with indices is a complete pain. Okay? But once you have this notation and you're fine with writing matrices, everything gets really simple. Okay? Good. Now I'm gone, so let me put me back into, scene, into the scene here. So I think it was like that. Okay. Good. So that is the PCA step by step. Okay? Here's an example. Yeah, this is now the example that I showed you already. Um, so this is basically the answer already. So how did I compute it? I mean, right now I'm, I'm just calling a function over here. So where is it? I'm just calling here the my own PCA implementation, which is missing from the notebook, okay? Since you should implement it, okay? Now, what is the difficulty here with the implementation? The difficulty is, is x along the rows or along the columns? So that's a bit tricky to get it right. And then you need to calculate the covariance matrix and get the eigen decomposition. And you need to find out, so is the first returned matrix the lambda or the v? You need to figure that one out. And then you need to check by multiplying them again, you get the covariance matrix. Once you get that, you have the right meaning of these matrices. And then you need to make sure, do I need to select the columns of V or do I need to select the rows of V? So what are the exact details? That's something for you to fiddle out. But it's not difficult. And if you get stuck, ask super early. Don't spend too long on it if you are stuck on it with some stupid bug and you can't see it. Just ask on Rocket Chat and someone else will help you or we will help you, right? I don't mind asking questions on Rocket Chat. I only don't mind if you copy the solution from someone else, right? But if you help each other, that's totally okay. Good, so far so good. Um, here's another one, um, eigendigits, yeah? So in principle, you can use any data set. So this is now my data set. Those are like the MNIST digits, okay? And a single MNIST digit is a 28 by 28 image. However, I can reshape it into a 784 dimensional vector. Yeah? And then I could ask, in this 784-dimensional space, maybe there's a lower-dimensional embedding that is already explaining most of the variance. So it's also a point cloud. And when you run I, my PCA method on it, you get these eigenvectors now. So confusing. So how is this an eigenvector? I mean, of course, the eigenvectors are 784-dimensional vectors, right? That's what the PCA will give you. And if I reshape them back to 28 by 28, I can look at them like images, OK? So the first thing here, that is like the eigenvector with the largest that explains most of the variance. It looks like a 0. And then the second one is over, over here, and the third one. And you see kind of each of them are adding like information for the different digits. And now variance means that if I only take the first 10, I can reconstruct almost all images already reasonably, OK? And that's something one could also try. Uh, it's also here in the Jupyter Notebook. So when you implement it right, you can also apply it. So I have here some code to, to plot the digits nicely. And you can also, for example, se select the zeros or the ones, and then it will make a, a PCA only on the ones. Let's see whether it works if I do that. Ah. Now, I think there was still a bug. OK, I better don't try it now. So there was a bug that I couldn't resolve. But I will include it um, once I'm finished with the lecture. I, I, lecture. I will include the missing ones. And then you could also, for example, show the eigendigits of twos. Yeah? So you could call them eigentwos. There are also eigenfaces, which I had previously in my lecture. But then, I don't know. I wouldn't like to have my face on every lecture here. So I removed all these faces. Basically, now imagine here having images of faces, and then there are certain eigenfaces, which are explaining most of the variance of images of faces. OK? Good. So far, so good. Those are the eigendigits. Um, so here's another slide. So we haven't gone through the math theory yet. So let's see how far we get, to get, get, to, get today. So first of all, estimators of the covariance. I just wanted to point out that there are two different ones. So there's a so-called sample covariance, which is basically this outer product 
where I'm plugging in like my sample mean, okay, and that's the one divided by n minus one in front of it. And as I said, that is the one that is unbiased, or in German, erwartungstreu, which means if I take the expectation for finitely many data points of this guy, the expectation of the sigma will be the true sigma, sigma okay? Um, there's another one, the maximum likelihood estimator of the covariance, and that's basically the same formula, but I have a one divided by n. And this thing is a bit overly optimistic. That was the story that I showed you before. If you estimate the mean um, of your data set, kind of the mean is the point that is optimizing the distances to all other points. And then if you calculate now the square dif di distances with respect to these estimated means, you are underestimating your variance. Okay, and that is basically here the story. So if you want to know more details, there's a whole Wikipedia page on this, right, for these two things. So my take on this is, doesn't matter so much for the numbers I'm looking at. For the digits, I had 60,000 digits. It didn't make a difference whether I do one divided by 60,000 or one divided by 59,999, okay? So if you have enough data, it, it doesn't make a big difference. The other thing is your data is anyway noisy, okay? So for our purposes, it's okay. But um, there is a theoretical difference between those two estimators. And typically, if you have an implementation of these covariance matrix, like in NumPy, they give you the option whether you want to have the unbiased one or whether you want to have the biased one, okay? So for practical purposes, I think it doesn't matter very much for us. So now, come, let's come to the math stuff. So why is the direction of the largest variance the eigenvector um, that corresponds to the largest eigenvalue, okay? So let's look at this. So here's, again, our optimization problem of finding the direction of largest variance. As I said, this is projecting all my data into one dimension, right? Into one direction of one vector. And I'm optimizing this expression now with respect to W with a side condition that W1 should have length 1, okay? If I wouldn't have the side condition, I could just let W1 go in any direction and I would maximize the variance, okay? So I need this. I could have put a normalization over here as well. That would have been another option to formulate the problem. But this is, at the end, simpler. Again, oh yeah, this is again explaining the formula of the covariance. I showed you already this thing on the board, okay? So you also have it here in the slide. Here I'm using the notation that if I have a matrix X, I can have two sub-indices the first for the row, the second for the column, okay? Maybe that's a better notation than the one that I used on the board, okay? And make sure that you understand that. Once you are super happy with the XX transpose, it's super powerful just to write it down and to do calculations with it, okay? <coughs> if we have this notation for the covariance matrix, curiously, we can rewrite this variance, okay? So how can we rewrite it? This norm of this vector, yeah, by writing it out, is just the vector times the vector transposed, which might confuse you a little bit because uh, it also confused me, right? Isn't it the other way around? Isn't it the inner product? The reason here is W1 times X is a row vector, okay? And if you want to square up all entries of a row vector, you need to transpose the other way around. So since that is something that I had a little hurdle with, so it was a little hurdle for me, let me write it down so that it's clear. So first of all, the stuff that you know. So V is V1 to whatever Vd. And then if I want to square up all entries, I'm calculating the inner product, okay? Now, if my W is a row vector, okay, so it's W1 to WD, if I would use the W transpose W, I would calculate actually the outer product, okay? And for that reason, I need to put the transpose over there, okay? That's it. Now I'm, ent now I'm having basically a row vector times a column vector, right? Because this was a row vector transpose is a column vector. And then row times column, at the end, I will have a scalar as I want. It's just a thing 
how to write things up. Now, in this, um, on the slides, the w1 is the column vector. OK, great. I messed it up on the board. But OK, so the w1 is a column vector. I transpose it and multiply it with the matrix from the left. Then the result will be a row vector. So if I would calculate this norm here, I need to copy this expression and transpose it and write it to the right-hand side, which I just did here. OK? So now what does it buy us? It buys us, oh, there's this x times x transpose that we recognize immediately that this is a covariance matrix. OK, great. So um, we can rewrite our objective of maximizing the variance by find a vector w that I multiply from the left and the right to my matrix okay, to get a scalar and find the w1 that is kind of maximizing this value. And um, I can write down the Lagrangian for this, uh, which is now w1 times sigma w1. I have a Lagrange multiplier. Let's take a Greek letter. Which Greek letter comes to mind to you? Lambda. Okay, let's use lambda. Um, however, it's a nice coincidence. This will be exactly the eigenvalue at the end. So the eigenvalue is just a Lagrange multiplier. How nice is that, right? So that is very nice. It's a Lagrange multiplier to the constraint that w1 has norm 1, OK? And as you know, the Lagrange multiplier is 0 if the constraint is not fulfilled. And then if the constraint is fulfilled, the Lagrange multiplier can be some positive number. And it will be exactly the eigenvalue. So if I calculate now the differential of this guy, put a d in front of it and dragging it in, I'm getting this expression where I can now just read off the derivative and set it equal to 0. When I set it equal to 0, I'm getting exactly the definition of the eigenvector that you know from linear algebra. OK? So by applying the method of Lagrange multipliers, we basically derive an expression where we can read off Oh, w1 must be an eigenvector. That's exactly the definition of it. And lambda 1 is the eigenvalue. OK, great. Um, of course, now the question is, is it the largest one? Or is it maybe the second largest one or the third largest one? Let's rewrite this expression and multiply again from the left-hand side at w1. We can do that, right? If that equation is true, also this equation must be true. However, our w1 is equal to 1, yeah? so this is just equal to the lambda 1. So what we are seeing here, by maximizing this function under this constraint, basically we are maximizing the Lagrange multiplier lambda 1. And if we maximize it, it is exactly maximizing the eigenvalue. Okay? So the result is that w1 is the eigenvector for the largest eigenvalue. So here we use the math kind of to get nice expressions that we can understand with our linear algebra. And then we say, OK, great, we need the method Ike that someone else implemented already. So now what about the second largest variance? OK, let's look at that one. So we get another constraint. We get w1 times w2 should be 0. They should be orthogonal to each other. OK? So the Lagrangian written down, we get a second lambda 2. OK? That tells me that the length of w2 should be also equal to 1, and that will be the second eigenvalue. And I get some other Greek letter, in this case a new, for the orthogonality. Then when I calculate the differential, I get another derivative, which I can set to 0. And now if I play around with it with the same trick, multiply from the left with w1, OK, then it turns out that this point will be 0. OK, great. This point over here will be equal to 1, so I get the new. And <coughs> the w, um, uh, let me just see, the uh, w1 times sigma, yeah, that is exactly equal to w1, right? That was the definition of being an eigenvector. So I can replace the w1 transpose times sigma with lambda1 times w1. And then this is the inner product. According to our constraint, it's equal to 0. And it turns out the only thing that remains is the new being equal to 0. So new must be equal to 0. And thus, the term over here disappears. And I get the definition for the second eigenvector. OK? And so on and so forth. Yeah? So that is the derivation, how one can see 
that the solution are really the eigenvectors, okay, and the eigenvalues. We won't use like an optimization problem to solve this. You could, right? But we have this eig typically, which is even more efficient to calculate. Okay. So, so far so good. Or any questions? I mean, you should interrupt me anyway, right? If I'm too fast. Ideally, I have said everything. If I haven't said everything, and you see something like during, during when you watch the video again or when you go through it, um, you can always ask on Rocket Chat, of course, right? Maybe there's just something missing on the slide. Good, let's get to the next point. So why is minimizing now the mean squared error the same as maximizing the variance, okay? So we are fine with maximizing the variance. What about the other approach? Why is it the same? For this, we use a fancy way to write down now the mean squared error, which is just a trace of this matrix product, right? So this is just the Frobenius norm of um, the matrix X minus WZ. Yeah, or you can also view WZ as an approximation of X. And how good is the approximation? You take the difference and you take the Frobenius norm. Okay, so that's what I wrote down here. And in this case now, I'm assuming that the W transpose W should be also the identity matrix. So I'm looking for a basis. I want to have also like an orthonormal basis. Yeah? Um, of course, I'm optimizing over W and Z simultaneously, so the W does not have to fulfill that. However, you see this WLOG, which means without loss of generality. Okay? I, don't, I forgot what it's in German. What is it in German? Ah, ohne Beschränkung der Allgemeinheit. So that's exactly the same thing. OBDA is equal to WLOG, okay, in English. So that's the same thing. So what do I mean by this? It means, um, how can I ask for this, right? Can I always find a solution? Yeah? Suppose you have a solution that minimizes this with W and Z, where my only constraint was I want to have a low dimensional embedding. So the W should be like a matrix with only D columns. Yeah? Suppose I have any solution, right, where the W does not fulfill this constraint. Then I can take the SVD of my W, okay? If you don't know what it is, I will explain it later. The SVD is the decomposition of any rectangular matrix into a unitary times diagonal times unitary matrix. So it's something like the eigenvalue decomposition, but for rectangular matrices, okay? Very useful. And I could just rewrite my W, and then I move terms from the W to the Z, okay? And by Z, at the end, the W will be this unitary part of my initial solution. So without loss of generality, I can always ask for such a solution. If there is a solution, I will also find one that fulfills this constraint. Great, so let's write down the Lagrangian, right? Um, and now this is really, I mean, I, I enjoy it, so this is super powerful, right? I mean, there was a lot of thought going into this way of writing these things down. But the thought that you had to put in was about multiplying matrices and becoming familiar with the notation of matrix matrix stuff. Once you're fine with that, now this is like a very powerful statement. Basically, I'm now having the function I want to minimize minus the trace of my constraints times this M here, where M is now a matrix of Lagrange multiplier. So that might be new and confusing to you. So here's a slide. So you remember this Frobenius norm. And um, if I have like two matrices and I want to sum up all entries, that's like an inner product between two matrices, right? And that can be written as a trace of A transpose times B. Okay? So, so far we only looked at the special case trace of A transpose A, but I could plug in another matrix in there and that would dot multiply all elements and sum everything up. Okay? So that is a very nice way to, to write things now. So, this is actually my constraint. I want to sum up over all my constraints, some of which are saying the length should be one, some of which are saying the, the, they should be orthogonal to each other. So this can be written like another notation I like a lot, the Iverson brackets, also great notation. So the Iverson bracket is this thing that takes a Boolean expression and then it calculates to one or zero. We use it all the time in NumPy when we multiply a vector with a Boolean vector. That's exactly what's going on. And this is the way to write it down mathematically. So basically now, if i and j is equal to, is equal, I will get a one, okay? So the norm of the vectors should be one. 
if i and j are different, I get a zero, and so it means w i and w j should be orthogonal to each other. And each of them gets a Lagrange multiplier, which I cleverly call m sub i j, and then I can just rewrite all of them with this inner product for matrices. Okay? This is really nice. And of course, it takes some more brain power to think about it, but once you have it, I think it's useful. Good, so that is how I got to this um, way of writing down the Lagrangian. This is just the usual way to write it down, but I have matrix entry many constraints here. Okay, so I have as many Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so far so good. So we are happy with this Lagrangian. Let's calculate the differential of this guy, putting a D in front, and when you go through all these formulas, this part over here, I think it just disappears if I take the derivative with respect to z because there is no z. And the, the front part, it turns out it will be something like minus 2 trace blah, 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 okay? Let's set the derivative to 0, which is basically this part over here. So it will be x times w, which is this term, minus w, uh, z times w, w, yeah, which is the term on the right-hand side. And since they are equal, the minus sign becomes an equal sign. Okay, w times w transpose is the identity, and so I get a solution for my z. And this is now giving me a closed-form solution for the z to plug into here. So here I was optimizing over w and z, and now by writing down the Lagrangian, setting a derivative to zero, I get a closed form solution for one of the variables that I now can plug in back in here. And then I have a simpler problem where I only need to optimize the w. Okay? So we plug this into our objective. So we replace the z's everywhere with w transpose x. And again, if you go through the matrix matrix things, and of course at this point you might say, Oh, it's also getting complicated and a bit messy. I agree. Try the other variant, and maybe then either you like the other one or you like this one. But it gives you another way to talk about it. Also, if you look at the other presentations of PCA, this part is often glossed over, right? So they just say, yeah, you can do it. Someone can do it at some other place, but not here, OK? So here we did it, and it's getting a bit messy. So if you look at the expression, everything becomes nice. So first of all, here we have a w transpose w in here, and you can just replace it with the identity. Then we have a w times w transpose, and if we know this, we cannot replace with anything nice. However, these two terms become the same term, and so the minus 2 plus 1 becomes a minus 1. Okay, And we get now this expression. Great. So. Let's see what we want to prove. We wanted to prove that the argmin in two variables, z and w, yeah, so the approximation of the mean squared error, is the same as maximizing the variance. And that's what we can just write down now. So we have the argmin of our changed expression. Then we know that on the first part, there is no w, so I can omit it. Right? It's important for the minimum, but it's not important for the argmin. So the argument just wants to have the solution, just the w. So I can omit this term, and I end up exactly with the term that I need for the variance. OK? So this is finishing the proof that it's the same thing. Again, I show you PCA step by step, and it's the same slide that I showed you already before. I just showed you the background behind it, why the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix are the solution. And I showed you why does the um, Minimizing the mean squared error is the same as maximizing the variance, as is, maxim as is finding the largest eigenvector. Okay? They are all the same things. Good, so far so good. By the way, why do I torture you with that one? Right? I mean, it's just this, this should give you tools in your toolbox that you can use for your own problems. Of course, you can use PCA from sklearn, and you can just apply it. But maybe you come up with some other setup where you want to do something else. And then try to write it down with matrices, try the differential, matrix differential calculus, try to write down the Lagrangian, and see whether you can solve it. And those things you cannot just take from sklearn. Those things then you have to invent yourself. Okay, So that is the idea of all of this. Good, so far so good. So summary overview, time's over. 
So the idea of PCA is either to maximize the variance or to minimize the mean squared error. Right? And we showed that they are basically the same thing. In particular, for the mean squared error, we showed that there's a closed form solution for the Zs once you have the W. Okay? And then we plug it in, and then everything becomes very nice. The other result was that the direction of the largest variance is exactly the eigenvector for the largest eigenvalue. Okay? So that is the other result, which is very important. And then I, sh I also wrote down the algorithm step by step. Okay? Good, so far so good. Um, I think that's it for today. Actually, I also wanted to do kernel PCA, but we had so much fun on the board with all these sub-indices, and I think it's good to write it down and to work it out, and maybe also sometimes to see someone else doing it. But at the end, you should do it yourself, and when you've done it yourself, then you are on top of it and you can really use it. So the other outcome of this lecture is to, to give you like a new programming language to think about math and to think about linear algebra. And help, I hope you also find that one useful. Good, so next time we will do kernel PCA and maybe we have to change the exercise sheets. Okay, see you next week. Bye-bye.